Hello, you guys. So I know it's been a while. I actually really missed uh, filming videos and anal anal analyzing with you. Uh, so today we're going to be anal analyzing Persepolis by Marjan Satrapi. So this is kind of a different uh, book, meaning that this is a graphic novel. So the analysis is quite different. It's actually a bit more fun, especially if you're a visuals person and you like art. Um, This would actually be really nice for you. So today I'm just going to be like guiding you on how you actually analyze Persepolis and not only how you analyze it, but how you like, you know, see beyond um, pers a part, like um, a Satrapi's words. And yeah, basically, so let's begin. So what I'm going to be doing is just I'm going to be overgoing like certain events, but not every single event that, that way you can like actually focus more on the analysis tools and techniques and the graphic uh, tools as well. But at the same time, we'll overgo the events and of course the typical literary analysis as well. So let's begin. So first, I'm just gonna give you a small, small overview over the author's choices, even though there are many, many authorial choices throughout the graphic novel, but we'll go over them throughout the analysis, but this is just the main stuff you should know before. And again, it is preferable that you have read the novel, even though it does not take a long time, if you sit maybe for maybe an hour, hour and a half, you can finish it for sure. So I do recommend you do read the novel before um, watching the video. But if you don't, I guess you'll kind of understand because you are overgoing the events as well. So now uh, the author's choices. Firstly, it is a graphic mem uh, memoir, meaning that the writer is also a character in the story. And in this case, the writer is the main character of the story. Second, it's in black and white. Now, the significance of black and white is that Black kind of resembles negative and white resembles positive, meaning that usually when events are like they have a black background or so, this means that this is a certain negative um, aspect in Satrapi's life, whereas white is more of a positive memory in her life, meaning that whenever something's like negative or she like correlates this event with negativity and it's like a bad chapter in her life, let's say she's gonna put the background in like negative, maybe when someone uh, in black, maybe when someone dies, just something sad in her eyes. And then white something like it represents her triumphs, her happy moments. So yeah, and sometimes it's even a mix. Uh, and it's, it's it's really used for it's uh, actually well it's used in color symbolism and not only that but it's it's used um, in many ways to juxtapose and we're gonna be talking about the juxtapositions a lot because she does use this a lot to you know highlight many aspects throughout the novel. Uh, and then uh, this is like verbal narration meaning that she's looking back at it like now like basically in the narrative voice. Um, it's a perspective and emotional response of the author, meaning that she's about approximately three years old when she was actually writing that novel. Um, and basically, she's looking back in retrospect to the events. And by retrospect, I mean that with the knowledge she knows as an adult, because as you know, she was a child, especially because we're talking about the first volume of Persepolis. She was a child, meaning that she did not completely understand her surroundings and she did understand to a certain extent. But now looking back at it, she has so much more knowledge, especially as an, as an adult and looking in, in res retrospect, she's going to be talking about the significance of these events and how they actually affected her and those around her, especially when it comes to the political side. Uh, of the events and then the structure and narrative sequence so basically what Satrapi did which is again another uh, authorial choice and analysis tool as well um, is the way she she positions or sequences the uh, certain images basically many juxtapositions happen between these images and um, what she does is that she uses graphic weight now graphic weight is another um, tool we're going to be talking about uh, throughout the video basically when she may basically elongates one panel more than the other if she uses a specific sequence she enlarges one panel she centers one panel the way she just puts these panels in a certain page is because she maybe wants us to look at one panel more than the other maybe she wants to showcase the importance of a certain event or a certain conversation so that's what she does or certain theme or certain idea so basically she elongates and enlarges depending on um, the message she's trying to convey to us as readers and the montage is basically when you combine many images to create one effect. And then it's a it's an autobiography of her life. So now chapter one revealed. So the setting is Tehran, which is the capital of Iran. And it begins at the same time as the Islamic Revolution, which we know was a very important event in Iran because it changed the Iran, especially like Iran we know today 
is the Iran we know today because of the Islamic Revolution. So as you know, one of the confusing aspects, especially for uh, maybe young readers, is that um, this a lot of history and politics is embedded into this novel. Um, so basically, the, in the Islamic Revolution, especially at the beginning, in Iran before that, they did not have to wear the veil. It was not obligatory. But after the Islamic Revolution, or, or during it, let's say, it became law, it became a rule that you have to, it's obligatory to wear the veil. And this was, um, this well, it can be interpreted as a symbol of misogyny and the veil not itself, but this event uh, can be interpreted as that. Why so? Because Marjan and her mother, um, they did not wear veils and many young girls did not wear veils because as we, we'll see that, we talk about that in the next slide, but they did not wear veils. Uh, so like I said, especially young females, so they were not fond of wearing them and they didn't understand the reason they had to wear them. So it was kind of very um, controversial and there was a lot of um, disagreements in the country. But in the, the, the part that was misogynistic about it wasn't the fact that you had to wear it, it was the way you, you were forced to wear it, meaning that these women were threatened with their lives. They were beaten if they didn't wear these veils. And especially the dictatorship that was happening, the tyranny that was taking place in Iran, that's that's why it was seen as a misogynistic thing because these men were forcing them to wear the veils. It wasn't out of their will. And before the revolution, Marjan used to attend a bilingual school, meaning that they used to like learn two languages there. And it was a French uh, school. They learned French and then they learned their actual language. And bo both the girls and boys attended the school, uh, but this change, they were uh, segregated. And we're going to also talk about that in the next panel. Therefore, the changes were hard on her and she didn't have a very good view of what was happening. And she wasn't very content about what was the changes taking place in her life. And then uh, her mother uh, is a feminist icon, suggesting that she's a modern woman who pertains a modern ideology. And we can also see there's always this contrast between the actual uh, revolutionary, uh, the Islamic revolution um, point of view. And then we have uh, Marjan and her family's point of view, which is very modern, very westernized. And then we have uh, the point of view of those around them. And you can just see them juxtaposing the whole time and contradicting each other. And this is, this is how we like, we get to see the different point of view. Uh, and this is how we actually get to understand the Iranian point of view. It's because of the contradictions taking place. And then the author is extremely religious and dreams of becoming a prophet. Uh, the Islamic revolution and its regimes are making her have contradictory thoughts and questions. Her uh, question, she, they make her question her ideas on Islam, which is ironic. Furthermore, it falls under the theme of identity. Okay, so basically, this is actually very like this is actually the kind of the the main point at least in the first half of the novel. Why? Because we know that the fact that she wants to be a prophet shows how much she loves her religion and shows how important her religion is to her. Frankly, but the thing is that the Islamic revolution this this highlights the fact that the Islamic revolution isn't. They're using the word Islam as a way of propaganda. Why? Because they're saying this is Islam, you have to do it. And because of the people, they love their religion. They're forcing these people to omit to certain rules that aren't particularly particularly linked to Islam, but they're using it as an excuse. They're using it as a disguise for them to actually do what they want, which is actually propaganda. And they're making little Marjan um, confused about what she believes in and whether... Um, Islam is what she really wants to be a part of. So now we're going to begin with the graphic analysis and teach you bit by bit. So basically in this image, 10-year-old uh, Marjan seems upset and you can uh, like you can tell by her face expression. So I always talk about the face, what you can see, and you can always talk, say that the eyes are truly um, the window of the soul. But here we can see that her eyebrows are partly arched. She's not happy. She's looking dead straight at the camera. And um, because she opposes the fact that she should wear a veil, um, the Muslim regime of uh, Iran thinks differently. They think that the woman should have to wear the veil because everyone in Iran needs to follow their religion. Again, the propaganda, you can see the propaganda and how they're making people follow certain rules because of the religion. So they're using it. They're actually abusing religion. And clothing is an important part, uh, important to Iranians because the smallest changes show your allegiance. Uh, now we're going to... Um, uh, analyze the certain quotes again the literary part the year is uh, the year is become obligatory to wear the veil at school so the word obligatory it has a negative connotation to it because it suggests the fact that the author is not fond of wearing the veil as she wears it against her own will um 
uh, this should be an eye, I'm sorry, shedding light on the fact that the Islamic revolution is decreasing liberty throughout the nation, especially for women, highlighting the theme of gender inequality. So we can also see the theme where women are actually losing certain rights and they're actually pinning it on Islam, even though it is actually sexism uh, at its finest. And so now this is um, a note I took at the class lecture. So um, in the first panel, we see 10 year old Marjan uh, frowning and it's uh, well, I actually mentioned that from her uh, arched eyebrows. And the second panel, all the girls are, are looking straight into the camera. And the thing is, um, they all look like they're the same girl, which except their hair, actually, which uh, shows that they're all actually not content and that the veil is actually making them all lose their identities to a certain extent. And we can actually see Marjan's actually like cut out from this image. And now um, this is the juxtapositions is what I keep talking about. Um, on page three, I don't know which version you have of the novel, but mine is the, the version which has like the red background. Um, so basically on the third page, um, there's a photo which we just talked about that had been taking place after the revolutions where all the girls were like frowning, they were looking downwards or they weren't looking or they were looking sideways. Uh, and you can just see that their eyes, they were, they were either like frustrated or they were sad. Like it was just both of, both of these negative um, emotions. And then on page four, we see um, uh, an image taken before the revolution and had both boys and girls like I previously mentioned and they were all like just together and even though they didn't all look happy they looked like typical kids you know like kids like this is what the typical class background looks like a typical class photo so you can just see how now they just don't want to look at the camera and here like most of them are looking at the camera and if they weren't they were just distracted like typical children so you can see their childhood being stripped away from them and you can just see the toll that this revolution has taken on them and again, this is part of the juxtapositions that Satrapi um, like does. This is just how she conveys certain messages with, without actually having to say certain things ex explicitly to readers. So now we're going to talk about this. This is actually maybe one of the most, if not the most important uh, panels in the whole novel. So firstly, in this panel, color symbolism is used, where the women wearing hijabs uh, are, are in black. And this is actually villainizing them, making them look like they're villains, making them look as if they are wrong. And the women on the right are in white, portraying them as innocent, portraying them as angels, uh, perhaps. And then the women, the women wearing hijabs as well, they have their eyes closed, indicating that they have their minds closed and they don't want to hear anything else and they don't want to see anything else. And they don't, don't want to hear the, the side, the, uh, the other side, which shows that they aren't open minded, they're closed minded. And then the women, the women as well wearing the hijab, they're looking upwards and they have their noses upwards, which shows how, how they think they're superior and how they think that no matter what the other side has to say, they will always be right. And then the non-hijabi women, they all have different hairstyles, meaning that they all are individuals of their own, they have their own identity, and they, they actually refuse to be brainwashed uh, as they are focused and they are filled with emotion and passion. They actually have something to say and they have a mind that's working for themselves. Whereas these other women, they just have nothing going on for themselves. They just want to say the veil, the veil, the veil, the veil, and that's it. And uh, this is actually very important. And this is what I talked about, the sequence and like the way she positions stuff. It's actually like, Satrapi, she's brilliant. Um, she placed a non-hijabi woman on the right side and the uh, hijabi woman on the left side. Why did she do that? Because she wants, it's just her indirect way, like I said, her her way of putting her own opinion and like implementing her own judgments in her novel, in her autobiography, um, without, you know, making it explicit. And this is why she put these women, the non-hijabis on the right, because she personally thinks they are right. And she's vouching for them. Uh, now we're going to talk about the event where the author's mother dyes her hair. Um, I think, yeah, her name is Taji. And um, <clears throat> this just sheds light on the fact that um, her old self who lived in modern Iran in the modern world has now died. It also highlights the fact that the Islamic revolution uh, stands for deteriorating human rights and it's using Islam as a weapon uh, and it's abusing it at the same time to do so. Um, <clears throat> because as we know, human rights are to express uh, ourselves freely and it gives uh, insight on the government's propaganda and totalitarian regime and as you can see the author's mother looks at her reflection in the mirror devastated as she comes to the realization that everything has changed and the more that the revolution progresses the more she can sense her old life slipping through her fingers and as you can see we can also tell if you want to like analyze graphically <clears throat> we can tell she's looking at the mirror with the sad expression as you can see she's frowning her eyes look like they're like sad she's just 
in a melancholy state of mind and she's just looking at her reflection and this is one of the last times she can maybe even recognize herself now we're going to talk about the second uh, chapter the bicycle so basically it's also set in tahran uh, it begins with this okay basically it's the same setting as chapter one um now we're just going to be talking about a specific quote <clears throat> so i put my uh, prophetic destiny aside for a while so this is said uh, in page 10 as well if you have the red book this quote highlights the propaganda and to tell you totalitaristic regime of the government due to the fact that, the, that during the Islamic revolution religi religious individuals like Marja are putting their religion aside in order to prioritize other aspects of their lives that are falling apart due to the government's regime therefore it's ironic that the Islamic revolution is the Islamic revolution but it's actually parting the nation citizen from the religion of Islam and it's actually promoting things, things uh, that are against Islam so you can just see the irony and uh, the propaganda taking place <clears throat> Furthermore, in this chapter, the theme of importance of education is introduced as it can be deduced by readers that the author is able to understand complex events that are taking place around her due to her knowledge, that, uh, due to the knowledge that she is having access to through books. So again, many themes are highlighted because, <clears throat> again, this is a coming of age novel. This is a, um, <clears throat> this is a biography of her life, especially when she was a child. And when you're growing up, there's many, many things going on in your life. <clears throat> especially during this like certain event where she's actually during a historic event that actually altered the country's history maybe even other countries histories but of course mainly iran so you can just see um how um different aspects of her life are changing while the while, and how politics is affecting it so now we're gonna talk about this panel so the revolution is like a bicycle. When the wheels don't turn, it falls. So basically, this is a simile, uh, which is comparing the revolution to a bicycle and uses the comparison tool like. I always talk about comparison tools uh, like uh, and as. And this is the same thing here. In a deeper sense, the author means that if the people do not start moving towards making changes, no change will take place and the events that are taking place will continue to take place, uh, such as the abuse, um, the totalitarian regime, and all of these things. In addition, the bicycle is a symbol of the revolution as an effort needs to be exerted in order for it to actually move or else the bicycle will end up falling. The same applies to revolution, thus making it a symbol. Moreover, we can interpret from the quote that the author is an extremely wise individual despite her young age, as she is able to understand the components of a successful revolution, despite many individuals who are older than her age, who are not able to. So, okay, so this is very important because many people who are older than Marjan, uh, because she's very young, you know, uh, that are actually participating and active in this revolution, whether uh, whether actually despite any of the sides they're in, we can know that Marjan has such an insightful outlook because she is educated. So we, we just like kind of, this is just like on the side, we just kind of learn how important education is. And not only that, but they do talk about in the novel and maybe it's in the uh, in the in these slides that I have prepared, but we do they do always talk about how they make uh, young men and they actually started closing universities uh, and making them not attend and not continue their education, not pursue and uh, their education because because they don't want them to be educate, uh, educated because education is the key to everything it helps people fight it helps them see the world in in a more you know um holistic point of view therefore we also get to see how important it is to be educated and how easily it is for it is for a person or individual to be brainwashed when they're not so education is a key weapon that every person needs in their life uh, and also a symbol of a bicycle it basically takes a lot of riders to keep it going and they have to be in sync if one person stops the whole thing is going to trip over tip over so basically the whole point is that many people need to be in this uh, need to be in it together in order for the revolution to actually be successful and this is actually like a uh, um it, it's just an like uh, illustration of the simile it just like gives uh a point like it just explains it technically and all that but we do know that this is a graphic novel so everything is explained using literature and non-literary elements so both and now um we're gonna be talking about certain concepts again like i said politics is deeply ingrained in uh, throughout this novel and there are many concepts that one might not be familiar with especially if they're not 
really uh, into history and politics. So basically, uh, dialectic, dialectical materialism is a way of understanding reality, whether it's uh, through thoughts, emotions, through the material world. This is important because, as we mentioned in the novel, the book uh, Dialectical Materialism is the author's favorite book. This can be emphasized or confirmed when, when she says, for a revolution to succeed, the entire population must support it. And this is on page 17. This quote indicates that the author has a good understanding of what's happening around her as she I, I, she's able to identify the flaws in the people's actions such as the lack of strength or even the, the most important thing is the lack of commitment because many people are not committed to the to actually like stopping what's taking place and now we're going to be talking about the water cell so basically um I'm going to also be introducing some concepts because like I said, there's many complicated concepts throughout this novel. Uh, Putish, basically Putish is a, uh, the definition is a violent attempt to overthrow the government uh, and the Bolsheviks are a radical far left and revolutionary movement founded founded in the Marx ideas. And actually um, Marxism um, is uh, deeply talked about throughout the novel and it's, it has to do with uh, sociology. And he was technically a sociologist who, a soci um, Marx was a, a sociologist who who actually created um, the concept of communism and he was actually found crazy and he was kicked out of several countries and he was homeless and uh, he had many, many problems. That's more in the realm of sociology, but he did the, the most important part we should know is that he was the creator of communism and he's deeply talked about throughout uh, the novel, which is very uh, important. The event where the author states that her, uh, states to her parents that she believes the king was chosen by God and her father tells her that's what they say. It showcases that academic, the fact that academic institutions are beginning to brainwash their students and adopting the regimes of the Islamic revolution. Because as we can also see throughout the novel, what happens is that these certain um, institutions, um, they start changing what they used to say before the revolution to to after the revolution these two things what they're teaching these uh students change and it's actually contradicting each other which is actually brainwashing and propaganda and for people smart enough so like margie who are actually you know they 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 get their they're in charge of their own education meaning that they learn inside outside of school no matter where they are these are the type of people who are able to see right through um such uh, propaganda, but others are not. So this just shows how um, education is also uh, vastly, vastly, vastly affected by um, by the uh, political events taking place. And it suggests uh, that there are various reasons uh, for the events that are taking place, as well as it suggests that the other side is wrong and there's a dispute on who is right. And now we're going to analyze another quote. I think you are old enough to understand certain things. You should know dot, dot, dot. Uh, this is on page 22 as well. This quote uh, falls on the theme of losing innocence because we get to see, especially this is very important because what's happening throughout this autobiography is that Satrapi is showing us how she, her, her view on the world changed. She had such an innocent view before this, uh, this revolution took place and how she actually got to see the world on how it truly is and all of these brutal events taking place. Uh, in the sense that in the first chapter of the novel, the author was uh, was extremely religious to the point where she had aspirations to become a prophet. However, the more the novel progresses, she begins to question her faith, and her father tells her in an indirect manner that God is not associated with every event and bad thing that takes place that happens. The event where the author takes a, a bath in order to emphasize with her grandfather, empathize, I'm sorry, with her grandfather, exhibits the fact that she is an empathetic and curious character. So again, through certain events, we get to know more about Margie. We get to know more about uh, the individual that she is. And now we're going to be talking about this certain panel. Um, Islam was used as a holy symbol and as a tool against people like I previously mentioned. In a deeper sense, the emperor would make rules and regulations that would make him more powerful, that were convenient for him by using Islam as a cover, by, by abusing it technically. Uh, furthermore, he would forbid a freedom of speech or any type of liberty to secure his position as an emperor. And lastly, he would make it seem as, as if he was sent by God. Thus, his citizens will view him as a god, as if uh, as if as if he can do any. Uh, if, I'm sorry, as if he can do no wrong, and they will not question any of his decisions. Decisions, and he will uh, have to be, and they will have to be content with living in an oppressed manner while he lives in a luxurious and comfortable life. So basically, this is just this basically just shows how propaganda was taking place, and how uh, basically people were brainwashed into giving. Um, 
the emperor out of the power that he wants in order to make in order to make all the decisions that he wants to do for him to get as much power as he wants to and then chapter four we're just gonna analyze one uh quote i read all the books i could so in the uh so this is on page 32 the fact that that uh that at the time the young author read all the books she could with the aim of understanding the events going on on around her displays the fact that she's an intellectual and curious character so we're gonna like we emphasize on that more evidence to that which can be seen as a recurring motif since in the last chapter she sat in the math top for hours in order to satisfy her curiosity regarding her grandfather's situation moreover this also relates to the theme of loss of innocence as the author has to understand political economic and sociological concepts all as i mentioned in order to gain uh, and understand uh, the events that are taking place around her forcing her to grow up fast and not be focused on the things for her age so basically like Margie, she was a child. Uh, children usually play games. They read simple books, um, fun books, fantasy books, fictional books. But uh, uh, in her age, she's actually like learning these really, really, really complex um, concepts, which people usually like maybe late, like teenagers, maybe at late, late, late teenagers start getting introduced to such concepts, especially at even they get uh, introduced uh, about it through academics. They do it through like educational institutes but she's actually doing it individually at a super super young age which actually shows what where, where she's at because of the situation actually also shows um how deep her understanding is and how far an educated person can go now uh this is a graphic analysis so in page 27 the image where the king is on top of a tower with his wife is a symbol of his power and the fact that he sees himself as superior to his people as he is above all of them physically and metaphorically furthermore he is wearing a huge crown on his head which emphasizes on the previous point mentioned furthermore the king's words contrast his uh, uh, contrasts his words meaning that um or the reason is that I am the light of the Aryans, which is basically in page 27, which is ironic because there's a night sky behind him. Moreover, this can be interpreted as foreshadowing as he says that he will bring light, which is something positive. However, the region will become a darker place due to his ruling and his regime. So what he says and what he does, his actions and his words completely, completely contradict each other, which again uh, takes us back to the theme of propaganda. And now we're going to be talking about chapter five, the letter. So basically, she says, I finally understood why I felt ashamed to sit in my father's cad cad Cadillac. Uh, this is chapter 20, no, not chapter, I'm sorry, this is page 33. This quote highlights the difference in social class, especially in the book setting. Furthermore, it can be deduced that Margie is a realistic and sensible character as she views her surroundings and is able to comprehend the significance of the events that are taking place. Um, and this also highlights um, Mehdi's story with Hussein. So basically, Mehdi is the Marjan's maid. And uh, uh, they, basically, I think she left her, her house. Uh, well, her house, Mehdi used to live in a farm and she had like many, many, many siblings. So her father gave her um, to Marjan's family for her to be a maid in exchange for her to be fed and at least, you know, given basic uh, human being uh, needs such as, you know, food, a place to sleep. Uh, she fell in love with Hussein, who was the um, next door neighbor. And because uh, Hussein, was, uh, Hussein was sending her letters, but Mehri is illiterate, so Margie would end up writing the letters for Mehri. The minute, or actually the moment, Hussein found out Mehri was a maid, he cut off all ties with her. Furthermore, the author's father says, because in this country, you must stay within your social class. So this was on page 37. This quote is self-explanatory because it because it suggests that people from different social classes cannot be together or even be associated with each other, also shedding light on the nation's ideology and social hierarchy and the way things are done. And this is chapter six, the party. In this case, as long as there's an oil, there's oil in the Middle East, uh, we will never have peace. So this is on page 43. Uh, this quote said by the author's father highlights the reality of the situation due to the fact that the leaders of these countries are participating in corporate activities in order to aggrandize their power. And the event where the author is confused when her teacher announces to the class that they shall tear out tear out the pictures for uh, uh, from the Shah, of the Shah, I'm sorry, of the Shah, shed light, sheds light on many points. Firstly, the school system is often brainwashing their students by constantly changing their perception of what's right and what's wrong. So basically brainwashing them. 
Furthermore, this setting can be interpreted as a totali totalitarianism, which is a form of government and political system that prohibits all opposition parties. So like we talked about, uh, outlaws uh, uh, individual and group opposition to the state and, and its claims. This can be interpreted as the children shall believe contradicting views depending on the political events that are taking place currently in the country. And the last thing is that this event showcases the author's liberate personality as she thinks for herself and does not succumb to brainwashing as she is not a sheep. Basically, by sheep, sheep's a symbol because they follow whatever uh, they, they, they see, they do not think. Her reaction juxtaposes her classmates' reaction as her classmates did not question, they just followed what was said by the teacher, however, she did. Uh, Ramin, whose father killed many individuals, is a representation of Iran. A uh, reason being that Ramin is judged for his father's actions, not his own, and Iranians are just and uh, judged and misinterpreted by the government. So basically, this actually happens a lot, not only in Iran but in the Arab world itself, because these certain politi politicians are, um, you know, undergoing certain activities and coming and like doing things that are not morally acceptable, and morally and ethically also acceptable. However, they are, however, these people are being judged by the actions of the politicians, and this is. Uh, uh, shown and uh, as an example through Ramin. Uh, so the this um, the, the 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 header, uh, the fireworks in the header represent celebration and festivity, but they also represent danger and hazard. Uh, therefore, although the Shah's resignment is positive, it uh, contains underlying negativity since the political unrest remains prominent in the country. So now we're going to analyze this. So Bird's eye view angle creates an honest perspective and emphasis uh, and emphasizes the amount of lives lost as a result of the massacres. The individuality of the dead man is subtle but shown. It implies that individu individuality is discouraged, I'm sorry, discouraged and punishable. And the black clothing em emanates the mention of Black Friday through anchorage and represents the negativity of totalitarian regimes as well as the dark and disturbing events uh, of it on society. Now, the eyes, the semiotic, being rolled back, represents knowledge being suppressed and extinguished. So now we're just gonna like, because this is all about the Shah, so I'm not gonna focus that much on the Shah, but I'm gonna focus more on next chapters as this video won't end. So let's go to further analysis. So we're gonna jump all the way to the passport when they're leaving. So basically the significance of the banner. So the image reflected in the banner and the title of the chapter are somehow ironic as it plays a role in foreshadowing the purpose of this section and allows the reader to realize the ironic meaning hidden behind the passport, which is illustrated. So the password, the passport itself, it is, uh, represents Margie's freedom. And it's the most important symbol. Margie encounters a number of uh, uh, bureaucratic obstacles when she applies for the passport that she's unable to get. These obstacles stand for the limitations imposed by tyrannical dictatorship on her freedom and identity. So now let's go to these panels. We're gonna, because I realized that we're just talking about the literary analysis, but I need to d delve more into the language, more into the graphic analysis. So in the first panel uh, here, um, the narration box indicates a setting where the main topic of the discussion in, uh, is martyrs. This may be manifested as a foreshadowing for the future. I'm sorry for the future events, as Uncle Tahir dies as a result of the totalitarian regime of the Iranian government, and the same applies for martyrs who lost their lives due to the internal war. In the second panel, in this one, Uncle Tahir and his wife exchange looks, both of them having disappointed looks on their faces. His wife is disappointed because Uncle Tahir is smoking, uh, and this is suggested by the fact that the color of the smoke from which the cigarette is black, illustrating her point of view, like I said, negative, positive, illustrating her negative point of view, uh, which using color symbolism, which is associate, which means that she associates cigarettes with negativity. Uh, so basically, then there's a transition to the third panel, uh, uh, where the, there's like a moment-to-moment -moment transition. Uh, in the fourth panel, the graphic weight is utilized by Satrapi in order to depict, I'm sorry, to depict Uncle Tahir's perspective on the use of cigarettes as the colors used juxtapose the panel above, as the background is black and the cigarettes are white, showcasing the contrast between his and his wife's perspective. So you can see what, what I meant by all of this, to like summarize it, is that Uncle Tahir, now we're seeing things from his wife's point of view. 
the smoke of the cigarettes black because she thinks it's something bad. Uncle Tahir is like uh, deteriorating his health. Whereas here, it just shows Uncle Tahir alone and shows that the flames of the cigarette are white, showing that it's something positive for him and helps him forget about all of the stress he's feeling due to the uh, state of the country, which is again a juxtaposition. And uh, here in the first panel, Uncle Tahir is complaining about the fact that he's not living with his son while blaming his wife simultaneously since she did not want to leave her country and family. His body language where his arms are raised demonstrates his anger, his frustration, uh, the fact that this, they just help us like visualize the moment and just see the tone. And then in the second panel, everyone is looking at Uncle Tahir except his wife. Um, because she's not able to see her husband in such a devastating state. The fact that the cigarette is black in this panel reveals that it's correlated with negativity in everyone's point of view, excluding Uncle Tahir. In addition, Uncle Tahir represents the phrase, they kill me, meaning that, I'm sorry, repeats the phrase, they kill me, twice, foreshadowing his death. Furthermore, the mood in this page is common for all characters, excluding Uncle Tahir, of course. And then in the third panel here, Margie's parents are, discu uh, are discussing uh, Uncle Tahir's emotional state. Uh, the gutter between them, the gutter means the space. The space uh, between them illustrates the tension in the room. Uh, because usually, like, um, authors usually use gutter to, like, show showcase tension. In the second panel, uh, Margie makes a sound, uh, tick, tick, like that. Like, I don't have to say it exactly, but it's like, tick. It's like, a, uh, onomatopo I'm sorry, onomatopoeia which implies that she's annoyed. It's basically a literary tool, like crack, um, ouch, like like these kind of tools, they're on the matopias. And then in the third panel, in the dark background represents Margie's blunt nature. It's also demonstrated by her parents' shocked face expressions. You can see that her mother has a question mark over her head um, and their, their eyes are wide open in shock, um, which expresses their confusion. And uh, here in the fourth panel, which is technically the fourth panel on the slide, for, I'm sorry, the fourth panel in general, like on that page, but it's the first panel in this slide, um, it showcases the mother giving advice to Margie in order to prove to her that she is still in need of her parents' guidance. Because again, we do know that Margie is very independent. We know that she gets information on her own, that she does not need much to help herself, but at the end, she is still a child, and she seems annoyed because uh, she responds to her mother without making eye contact with her. In the fifth panel, um, which is this panel, the second panel on this slide, there's foreground uh, where Margie is walking away. However, her eyes are still towards her parents, suggesting that she can still hear them. So basically, you can you can see that she's just like she's not looking at them directly, but she is looking at them kind of like she's still listening to them and she's still kind of with them, but she's exiting. And then in this panel, the third panel, which is the sixth panel on the slide, uh, is the midground because uh, the black background, the black background, so, uh, symbolizes Taji's worry. Taji is her mother, um, uh, which juxtaposes Margie's father's optimism uh, towards Margie's positive attitude. Because we do know that Margie's father, he's the one who kind of got her into all of these things, into reading books, into getting some particular interest, because he's the one who like kind of fueled started this. He's the one who gave her all this information. And then in the fourth panel on the slide, while Margie's parents are having a heartfelt moment, uh, the phone rings loudly and suddenly, and this is evidence from the zigzag shape around the bubble. So this is like a zigzag shape. It's kind of a minata if you want. And then in the ninth panel, another zigzag bubble is used to illustrate how loud Margie's father was and the chaotic tension in the house at that moment. And this is the last panel we're going to be analyzing. Remember, there's one more panel. Um, okay, so we're going to analyze these three more panels. Um, three more slides, I'm sorry. So in the first panel, the car is in the air and the lines behind the car indicate that the car is moving extremely fast. Uh, so you can see like these lines behind the car. And then the second panel, which is elongated. So this is like a, another tool used by Satrapi. Suggests that, uh, that, the, uh, that the event taking place highly altered Margie's psychological state. And the typo typography used uh, where the man says, give blood like all in bold. 
suggests the urgency and the anxious and chaotic atmosphere. In addition, the fact that Margie and her parents are still standing behind the ambulance displays how helpless they are in the situation, the fact that they really can't do anything about it. Um, and here, from this this panel, it's evident it's evident that there's nothing uh, that there is not enough place to accommodate everyone in the hospital because everyone's either injured injured or ill from the protests from all of these things uh, from the government's regime. Whenever someone does something that um that's basically a a basic human right, but again goes against the the political regime that's taking place, then they're gonna obviously um get physically assaulted, injured. So as we can see, people are scattered everywhere. Uh, and this can also refer back to the, the chapter 13 of the book, which is the key, where it's mentioned, where it's mentioned, like I talked about before, that young boy, young men or young boys are brainwashed into believing that there's a plastic key they would receive for, for going to war. Okay, so basically, in the key, it was mentioned that um, basically young boys were given plastic keys. And they were told that if they go to war, but with this plastic key was given the ability to go to paradise, to go to heaven. And they'd have everything they want there. So basically, this is again when un un uneducated people, especially people from lower classes, who still have money, like because Marjan was privileged at the end of the day, and it does man it is mentioned that her father does have a cat a ca Cadillac. So we're just saying here how um these boys were brainwashed. It just talks about how when people end up injured and having their lives deteriorated because of this um totalitarian political regime. Now here, this panel, on the first panel, the walls of the hospital are light. The reason being that the hospital is supposed to be a place where people are healed or saved from death, which symbolizes life. As we know, uh, there's this quote that a hospital has heard much, much more prayers than the actual church. Yet all the individuals in this panel are wearing black, reflecting their pessimistic mood and even foreshadowing for, for their events. On the second panel, uh, on the second panel, the panel is elongated, uh, showcasing that there's a major event. In the speech bubble, there are many, many ellipses uh, as she's taking deep breaths as she speaks. As you can see, there's many, many like lines here. Dots, I mean, there's many dots. She's taking deep breaths as she's crying because she can't constantly talk because she's crying. And then in these three panels here, they all, all shed light on the major theme of the uh, uh, one of the major themes in the graphic novel, which is the totalitarian regime of the Iranian government, which we mentioned constantly throughout the video. Part of this regime includes abusing religion and using it as a way to brainwash individuals. And the fact that the man says, if God if God wills it, meaning that he's, he's trying not to give her an answer, he's trying to just like, uh, in a sense, shut her up keep her quiet so he just said if god wills he just throws it on god and uses because he, he knows that everyone is religious so he just uses religion against them that way they can't say anything about it it's a power play rather than a devotion to his religion like i said this point is emphasized when uh, uncle tar's wife says all that all that creepy window washer had to become a uh, all that people wish window washer had to do to become a director was grow a beard and put on a suit so basically as you can see everyone um now doesn't have does not have to be educated they don't have to do anything all they have to do is just um abuse their religion um um succumb to the basic um basically uh, like propaganda to the to the propaganda to the to to the totalitarian regime of the government and you know what they'll get what they want uh, and this just shows the frustration. And then this is the last panel we'll be analyzing. So in these two panels, uh, which juxtapose each other, um, as the wide out view of her parents represents who they truly are, whereas the second panel makes her mother seem unrecognizable in Margie's words. The series of panels sheds light on the theme of oppressive Iranian regime that forces individuals to comply to certain regulations that they may not want to comply to, hence robbing away, uh, robbing them away from their freedom, but not also from their freedom, but from their identity, because we can see how her mother actually looks like here, and look at how she looks like in the passport. And then here, uh, in the last panel, we're going to be analyzing to establish a striking contrast between the woman and Marjan physically, high graphic weight is utilized on the woman's scarves. In the first panel, while light graphic weight is used on Margie, the contrast in their physical characteristics, however, actually represents the differences. Spiritually, basically, they mean like their ideologies. So you can see like Margie looks so tiny next to them and like she's wearing this mini, mini hijab uh, that barely actually covers her hair because you can see some of the hair here, whereas they are fully, fully, fully covered. 
and the shoes uh, on in the second panel stand uh, in for Marjan's loss of freedom uh, of speech as a result of the dictator dictator dictatorial Iranian freedom of speech as a oh no, as a result of the dictator I'm sorry uh, of the dict dictatorial Iranian government. The woman also orders her to stop to stop up uh, to shut up. Uh, giving, uh, give, uh, shedding light on the Iranian dictatorship side. Last but not least, the phrase "it was evidence, uh, evident that she had no notion what the punk was" highlights the woman's brainwashing, and they actually don't know what they're talking about. They're just saying what they've been told to say. And then in this panel, Marjan's body language and height reveal her innocent, childlike nature because she is smarter and appears more frightened than the other women. So this is it, guys. I hope you liked the analysis on Persepolis. I hope this wasn't too long of a video, and I hope you understood everything. Thank you so much for watching. If you want actual notes and you want access to my email, then please join my Google Classroom in the description below. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.